All right, and it's time to get started. So this is a webinar about tracking your infrastructure logs and metrics in the Elastic Stack. With that, my name is Tanya Bragan. I'm a Senior Director of Product Management here at Elastic. I'm joined by Jamie Smith, who is a Senior Product Marketing Manager and my counterpart when it comes to talking to all of you about how our products uh, can be used, what we've seen as successful, and so on. So uh, from an agenda perspective, I'm going to kick you off with some context. I'm going to go through some slides on how we ingest data for logs and met uh, metrics uh, for, from infrastructure perspective, how we store them, what makes Elasticstack a good, good data store for operational data, uh, and a little bit on data visualization, although we'll save the best really for the demo. I'll also give you a quick overview of Elastic APM. While that's not the main focus of this webinar, it's a highly related data source when it comes to operational data, and the demo will touch on it, so I think it'll be important to know about it. And as I mentioned, we'll close with live Q&A. So first, uh, a, a couple of definitions, just so you know uh, throughout the webinar what we mean by some of these uh, words. When we say Elastic Stack, we mean uh, a, a collection of open source projects that allow you to get data into Elasticsearch, which is our store for all kinds of data, but certainly operational data. On the ingest side, we have two projects. Uh, one is called Beats. Those are lightweight shippers that can be deployed directly on hosts. And one is called Logstash. That is more of a general purpose ETL tool that may or may not be necessary depending on the specifics of your deployment. And finally, uh, Kibana is our UI. You can visualize data in Kibana as well as use it administratively to manage a number of aspects of your deployment. All of this can be used in a standalone fashion. You can simply download all these projects and manage all of this deployment uh, infrastructure to get uh, uh, yourself uh, on your own infrastructure, whether it's on premises or in a public uh, cloud. We also have an orchestration tool called Elastic Cloud Enterprise, and it's something that would allow you to manage many Elastic uh, stacks together in an efficient manner. And finally, if you would like a fully hosted experience where you simply go to uh, a website and say, you know, spin up uh, Elastic Stack for me, I just want to send data to it. That is Elastic Cloud. This is our fully hosted offering that uh, is increasingly popular for a number of use cases and certainly for metrics and logs. So the Elastic Stack is fairly flexible, uh, but when it comes to specific use cases, we've identified opportunities to make it even more turnkey for those experiences. And today we'll focus on solution areas for logs, metrics, and APM. Within the solution areas, we look at things like how can we make data easier to ship uh, from a specific uh, data source that's relevant, or how can we help you visualize it better in a more turnkey fashion, or does it make sense for us to add a maybe a custom UI for a specific workflow that's uh, relevant to an operator? So this is what the solutions team focus, and actually I'm part of uh, a team that we're calling internally observability team that really combines these three use cases in a set of these curated experiences. So let's go ahead and get started. And again, the focus here will be metrics and logs. Uh, so let's start with data ingestion for metrics and logs. And as I mentioned in a preview, um, there's really only a couple of components you have to think, think about when you, when you get started with this use case. First is uh, lightweight data shippers. And for logs, uh, we have something called FileBeat. And FileBeat, as you probably can guess by the name, tells files. Uh, and those files could be just text logs or JSON logs. And you can go ahead and uh, get those into Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch has something called ingest node that can parse those logs for you. Uh, it supports Grok. It supports a number of other processors that are very co co commonly used to transform unstructured log data to structure that can be then visualized in Kibana. It's a very similar workflow for metrics. And again, you can probably guess by the name, MetricBeat is what you would use to gather metrics from your hosts. And MetricBeat will do things like you know, ping an API, get some measurements, and send it off to Elasticsearch. You may or may not need ingest node for those. Many metrics just simply come already in a structured format. To make it easier to uh, get structure from logs, we recently added something called a data visualizer within the machine learning part of our uh, offering. And this tool is really great for somebody who's just getting started or maybe has a new uh, log that is not yet in Elasticsearch. You can simply take a sample of that log, paste it in, and this tool will discover the structure for you and even suggest grok patterns that you should use to, uh, to, to analyze and to parse those logs on an ongoing basis. So check it out if you haven't seen that, it's fairly new. Uh, but for common log types that come from vendors that you know, just have a, a format that's well known, we provide a number of what we call file beat modules. 
and a file bit module will, uh, you know, you can simply, you know, it will simply recognize what kind of data you're shipping, or you can configure and enable this module for a particular log, and it will extract the structure for you, store this data in Elasticsearch in the most efficient format, and even give you a Kibana dashboard so that you can see this data right away. Uh, so very, very uh, turnkey experience for known logs, and this is just a couple of examples of those logs. So as you might expect, system, uh, system logs, uh, container logs are, are fairly popular. Everybody's got some of those. And for applications, there are a number of categories in which we have uh, these types of modules. And it's not a full list. This is just an example. Similar for uh, tur turnkey collection of metrics within metric beat, we have a concept of modules. And again, modules will do exactly uh, the same thing as with logs, uh, minus maybe the parsing, because again, metrics are structured by definition. And there are a lot more <laughs> metric types that we were already collecting. Again, system and containers are very popular. Uh, lots of our users are collecting metrics from Docker, Kubernetes, and other projects within that ecosystem. And uh, actually, for cloud environments, we have cloud metadata processors that will add uh, to your metrics metadata that is relevant to a particular cloud environment from, from which you're collecting data. And then for high level services, many of them have logs, but many of them also have APIs that you can pull for information such as, uh, for instance, in, in queues, the, the queue length, right? And maybe you wanna get that from an API and ship that periodically alongside your logs. So again, number of categories that are relevant. In addition to uh, file bit and metric bit, we have a couple of other specialized beats I just wanted to mention. And again, this is not going to be a full list. Uh, there are a lot more, but relevant to this conversation is heartbeat, which is uh, really great for uptime monitoring, right? So if you have file bit and metric bit running on a host, it's great if the host is up. But what if it goes down? Uh, absence of data may you know, simply, simply mean that there's just no activity. So maybe you want to monitor it externally and kind of generate synthetic traffic to just make sure that uh, this service is responding at times that you expect it to respond. And you can even deploy Heartbeat at different locations. So you can see what the response is like from inside your network, outside your network, and so on, because network often can be can make a difference in what the response is like. So Heartbeat is great at that. We actually just GA'd it in uh, a recent release. Uh, and it's been used very you know, heavily internally at Elastic. Our, our SRE and our infrastructure team are using it to monitor our own services. Last but not least, I wanted to talk about function beat. For those of you that have moved to more of a serverless architecture, you know, deploying file bit and metric bit may just not be what makes sense for you because you aren't even renting infrastructure. Your applications may be composed of these turnkey services that are getting data in. Uh, the code is maybe running in something like Amazon Lambda, so there's no server really, right? And the metrics and logs themselves may be shipped to other services like CloudWatch and CloudWatch Logs. So function beat itself, uh, the shipper itself will run within a Lambda. Uh, it can be triggered uh, by, by an event, for instance, from a CloudWatch log group, and uh, it will collect metrics and logs from various services and forward it most likely to Elastic Cloud at that point. You probably are using a fully hosted offering at that point, but maybe your own uh, Elasticsearch. It really doesn't matter. You can ship it to a number of places. Um, so we're pretty excited about this. A number of our customers have been asking for functionality like this, and we'd love your thoughts for anybody that's um, already moving in this direction. All of this data, um, you know, coming from different sources, really, you know, you benefit from, from this data in the same operational store if you can, can correlate it, if you can look at your metrics and very quickly drill into logs that are related to it. Um, and so for that, common field names become important. We have some common fields already, but uh, we are adding a lot more. We're calling this set of common fields Elastic Common Schema. If you'd like to follow along, there is a repo that, that's uh, on the slide here, Elastic slash ECS. We'd love your feedback. I know many of our users have already created their schemas internally, and we'd love to see what you've learned through that process. Uh, we, we have a number of discussions going on there already, and that's contributed greatly to the creation of the schema. So, so please take a look. And our go first goal is really to integrate the schema into the, the solutions that we're shipping. But um, some of you I know are interested in using it internally as well, uh, maybe for any data that you're collecting outside of uh, the, 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 the shippers that we provide. So feedback definitely welcome. Last but not least on the shipping side, um, the shippers that I'm talking about could get into hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands in some cases. And so a frequent question we get is, you know, is Elastic doing anything to make management of these shippers easier? 
And you know, a lot of you are already relying on config management tools, especially at scale, and those are still going to be relevant, especially as far as deploying and upgrading those shippers. But once they're deployed, uh, the question usually is, well, can I see them centrally? Can I see what configuration they have? Can I notice if there's a problem with the configuration? Maybe quickly fix it from a centralized uh, point as opposed to having to always go back to my config management tool. And the answer is yes, there is a Beats uh, central management feature that, that supports file bit and metric beat. And you can, uh, as a, in a screenshot here, uh, basically have a configuration snippets that, that are managed via tags. It's a very sort of easy way for you to uh, take deployed, deployed uh, shippers and uh, be able to see centrally what's happening with them and modify configuration if needed. OK, on to data storage. So collecting all this data is great. Uh, usually, users get excited when we talk about all the turnkey ways in which we collect data. But the next question is, well, Tanya, is the storage of this data going to be efficient? Elasticsearch is a search engine. Uh, I understand why I would maybe store logs in it, because you search logs. But what about metrics? Don't you need a specialized data structure, a specialized analytics engine for metrics? And I think to answer that, let's first take a look at logs and metrics side by side and really see what the data looks like. Um, logs are ultimately event data. Again, we always think of text logs, but it could really be just a queue where you're pushing events with some structure. And if you look at the structure of those events, typically there's a timestamp. There are some textual fields, sure, and some of them should maybe be available for full text search. Uh, but a lot of the metadata or you know additional data that's here in green that is numeric often the users want to take that and convert it to time series because you may want to you know do terms aggregations of them or plot them over time things like status codes or things like things like uh, transaction length that are in the logs so logs themselves are not heterogeneous they they start looking a lot like sort of these structured events with textual data and numerical data very quickly if we look at what's commonly called metrics, the main difference there is those are peri periodic measurements of something that has a continuous value. And you as a user really choose the frequency initially with which you're measuring that, that, that value. And yes, they're much more um, numerically dense, typically. But there is textual data associated with metrics, too. Of course, the metric name is there. There is some metadata about where the metric was collected, and maybe a number of user-defined tags. So if you squint, these logs and metrics start looking very similar. They have some numbers, they have some uh, strings, and they have some, some uh, timestamp information. And so it makes sense at that point to uh, basically you know, have your operational data store support all of this data natively. And that's exactly what Elasticsearch does. If you look at Elasticsearch internals, of course, there is an inverted index for full text search. We started off with a really heavy focus on big document uh, full text search, and that's there. If you want to search your uh, log message, that functionality is going to be there. But for any structured data, there is also a columnar store that in Lucina is called doc values that has been improved over time to handle different types of data, including numerical data. And in particular, for numerical data, there is a structure um, that is sort of underlying all of this that's called BKD trees that is really efficient for numerical operations. And you don't have to sort of select the, hey, I, I want to use a BKD tree. Elasticsearch figures that out based on the data type that you put, put in and does that behind the scenes. Uh, this is just an advantage you have uh, having this data in a store that you know can do that. So, you know, when it comes to numerical data, there's uh, a lot of efficiencies behind the scenes. And again, and some of the other webinars, we've gone into a lot more detail there. Uh, you know, I'm not going to ha have time really to, to uh, go into uh, a lot more than I, than I have just now. Uh, needless to say that we've put a lot of thought into how we can you know, efficiently store numbers in, uh, in Elasticsearch. Now, the last uh, sort of bit of this really had to do with what I mentioned earlier, which was um, the fact that metrics or periodic measurements initially collected a fairly high granularity. So the last piece that I think we were sort of missing when it comes to being a time series data store was the ability to do rollups uh, or down sampling of this data to a smaller granularity. And the reason you would need to do that is because you know data at sub millisecond granularity becomes, you know, when it comes to metrics, becomes less relevant over time. Uh, when you start looking at capacity planning use cases where you're storing metrics for, you know, months, uh, maybe even years, you don't need it at the same original granularity, but you do want to do aggregations in a faithful manner on that data with smaller granularity. So good downsampling that still retains the ability to do mathematical 
uh, operations and aggregations on it is very important. And our users uh, were doing this before manually uh, within Elasticsearch, but recently we've added a turnkey built-in rollup functionality. So Elasticsearch now has a rollups API. Uh, Kibana supports rollups in the UI, and you can now do this in a very turnkey way. And for many of our users, this was sort of a turning point where they said, you know, not only is it possible, it's actually very easy and natural for us to store time series data that's heavily numeric uh, and that are, that are periodic measurements uh, of metrics in Elasticsearch. So this has become a, a pretty common use case at this point. A couple of other things on the storage side. Um, Hot warm architectures, again, are pretty important for logs and metrics. We support them in Elastic Cloud. If you go uh, and, and start a deployment, there's a hot warm template there that's going to really help you. Um, you don't even have to make a lot of choices. It basically selects the same defaults for you for how you would organize your hosted instances of Elasticsearch. Within the stack itself, uh, there's a tool called, called Curator, uh, but we're also adding an uh, index lifecycle management feature that is uh, turnkey within the stack, and that's coming in the next uh, couple of releases. So Hot Warm, again, is natively supported uh, and you know really helps you make sure that as your data ages, you have an automatic policy uh, to, to go along with that. Okay, so now we're uh, you know, cl close to the end of the slides. Uh, data visualization is the last piece I just wanted to mention. Hopefully folks are familiar with Kibana. And in Kibana, there's a couple of key tabs that we'll be showing as part of the demo. Uh, there's of course, Discover. Discover is basically a document viewer for Elasticsearch. You can look at uh, specific documents. You can see their uh, sort of presence or absence over time. You can drill in, into details. There's a visualize tab that will allow you to take the structure that's in those documents and put it on a chart. And finally, a dashboard tab that allows you to put that together into a single pane of glass. Uh, maybe a less known feature, but very important for these time series use cases is something called time series visual builder. So when you go to the visualize tab in Kibana, under the time series category, there's a, um, you know, a tool called visual builder. And this tool uh, basically is built specifically to work with time series data and to apply regular and pipeline aggregations on top of this data to build charts like you see here, where you've got KPIs with event data overlaid as annotations. Uh, really powerful tool. If you're not familiar with it, definitely check it out. When it comes to these modules that I showed you earlier, where we provide your dashboards out of the box, many of them use this uh, time series visual builder as the underpinnings for building the charts. So you can find some good examples from the modules. Now, Kibana is great. And for ad hoc analytics, everything that I showed you is a really natural way to interact with log and metric data in Elasticsearch. But another thing that we've been sort of hearing from our users is that what about um, support you know, for turnkey uh, common workflows uh, that uh, you know, where, where you know, maybe a dashboard is not the most natural thing. And one of the views that we've been asked for is an infrastructure view, where basically at a high level, I can see all of my infrastructure components and I can see trouble spots within those components. And that's exactly what we recently added and we wanted to show you as part of this demo. This infrastructure viewer uh, allows you to uh, see your hosts, see your containers, and even see um, how those containers are orchestrated using Kubernetes. Uh, you can group by uh, parameters that are sort of natural within that, uh, things like node and na namespace within uh, Kubernetes, for instance, and be able to see at a high level where there is a problem and then from there drill into logs and metrics. Uh, as part of uh, Kubernetes in particular, we recently joined CNCF and we were just in KubeCon in Seattle, lots of excitement around what we can do for Kubernetes observability. So anybody that's got projects around Kubernetes and is already using uh, Elastic for logs, consider us for sort of full stack observability within this. We'd be happy to talk to you kind of about how that's done. And again, a lot of our demo will focus on that pretty shortly. And last but not least on the Kibana side is a log streaming view. So um, Discover is great. Again, it's a good document viewer within Kibana for Elasticsearch, but it's not always optimized specifically for streaming a large amount of logs, especially if you have a real-time problem where you want to see kind of a live tail. Discover is not exactly optimized for that. So we've added this. We have a live streaming view now that uh, looks like this, uh, basically, where you have your logs you know, natively in this console-like experience. You see a timeline on the side where you can see the, volu uh, the volume of logs. You can, of course, search. You can uh, you know, very quickly arrive at the log line that you need. And uh, you know, it, it supports everything you'd expect as a sort of an, an operator uh, from a log streaming perspective. You can see not only real-time logs, and, but historical logs as well. So that's an important uh, part of kind of how we've built this viewer. OK, so briefly, Elastic APM. Uh, so what do we mean by APM? 
and basically if you look at this request response pattern right there's a request that goes to a server and a response comes back maybe it's very slow seven seconds i fell asleep by now uh, or maybe an error comes back certainly logs and metrics can be used from externally from the application to see that this happened a log will tell you that a 500 error came back but why did this happen which particular line of code maybe caused an error or here which particular pattern and you know path through the application caused such a slow transaction especially if you've got microservices in the background you know which services were talking to each other to result in such a bad experience for the user often those questions are really hard to answer without you know measuring this type of performance transactional performance from within the application itself and that is exactly what apm does APM tools uh, you know, rely either on manual instrumentation or provide agents where, which auto-instrument your code uh, and then you know, show you this information in a UI where a developer can very quickly zero in on, on the root cause of the problem from an application perspective. Elastic APM is an open source uh, approach to this. We have a number of open source agents that will ship data to a uh, processing component called APM server. This is stored in Elasticsearch and of course uh, displayed, displayed in Kibana. And uh, when it comes to this aspect of distributed tracing that I mentioned earlier, we do support it. Uh, so you know the agents will actually communicate with each other and will uh, you know introduce a trace ID where if there's a parent transaction that calls another service, you will be able to see in a distributed trace view what happened, which service called another service, and at each point, what were the spans or the measurements from the application perspective so that you can really find out what went wrong. Um, for anybody that's out there that's already uh, played with this and maybe has looked into standards like open tracing, we support open tracing as well, right? So if uh, you have existing instrumentation and it complies with one of these evolving standards, we're you know very excited about them. We think it's important um, that to support something that is uh, that's going to help you really track the health of your applications from a distributed perspective. So at this point, let's go ahead and jump into the demo. Jamie will show you how we bring all of this together uh, to solve a particular problem. Thanks, Tanya. Um, hi, everybody. I'm going to go through. I'm going to touch on quite a few of the things that Tanya brought up and talked about. Um, the first thing, I just want to get a quick overview. We have an application. It's a, If you're familiar with some of the different demo things they have, this is the pet clinic application. It's just a standard thing they use to demonstrate Spring. It just has owners and veterinarians. We have apparently a veterinarian office that has a lot of specialized doctors. Um, I'm going to start in Kibana. We're going to be looking through kind of our faux inbox. The first thing that it's kind of useful to talk about is actually the architecture of that application we just saw. This application, it's all running on Kubernetes. We have, you know, there's a three node cluster. I think we have three nodes. Each of them are 64 cores. I forget how much RAM they have, but we have the systems. Each of the layers is set up for fault tolerance. So we have multiple instances of these things. We have at the top end, we've got the React layer. This is the, these are the things that are running in the browser, being sent to the browser. And then we have Kubernetes services wrapping each of these things. So they're to so the fault tolerance is there. We have on the left side, we have MySQL. We have a Spring Java talking to MySQL. And then we have Python Flask applications talking to Elasticsearch, performing the address finding lookups. Within each of these components, we have the various beats and systems running. So we have file beat, packet beat, and metric beat on most of them. And then on the MySQL, we also have audit beat running. So we're gonna kind of drill down through these through some of these things. So we get an, you know, in my role here, I'm a uh, I'm an ops person to get an email from our system that the uh, website was getting some slower than usual response times. Uh, it's going to take me on a link. I'm going to jump in here to our machine learning. This is taking me into the anomaly viewer. If you're familiar with machine learning, you, you, you may have seen the screen, but machine learning, it's really going through and looking at times, looking at values to tell us where certain outliers are. Sometimes you're sitting there looking at the screen. Things might look really bad, but you can't tell how bad they are. Machine learning adds some automation to that. In this case, this job, we're comparing two different jobs. If I hover over one of these things, it tells me these two different things. We have the pet clinic spring request, and then there's also the pet clinic node. So you saw there are different tiers. We had node and spring. It's giving us an error showing that you know, some of these are a little bit of, of, out of normal. And we kind of see that there's a almost a uniform distribution of these things. I can actually click down on one of these things and it will refine it 
And it shows that we definitely had a period of time where we had some orange. The, the closer to red it is, the worse it is. In this case, this red one that we clicked on had a pretty high anomaly. With machine learning, you can actually set up, with your jobs, you can set up links that will take you in the time, same kind time context to different places in Kibana. We're actually going to jump in here now. We're just going to take a quick tour in the, uh, actually, the APM interface at this point. Just to give a high level of what we're looking at, we see at the top left response times and requests per minute. I can actually filter down through there and I can see if I get rid of my 200s and 400s, these are the not founds and the, 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 the successes and not founds. We can actually see where we had this slowdown. We're not having errors. So this is kind of, you know, we're del delving in trying to see where is this slight, this site slowness coming in? What is causing this? So it's not errors that are causing it. We're just really seeing that something happened at about 7 p.m. on in my time zone we can actually drill down and we can see that the way it's sorted here it's sorted by impact so the impact it's not necessarily what is slowest it's not what's executed the most it's really taken those things into consider both of those things into consideration so i can go ahead and click on this so we're looking at the owner's rest controller an operation called get owners so if i click on these things this little piece here in the middle this is a response time distribution. It looks similar to the last screen, but it's saying the things on the left, these are these are much faster response times. And the things over here on the right, they're a bit slower. I can scroll down and I can see, looking through, seeing that there's really a lot of select statements in here. So there's something going on that something is inefficiently looping and doing selects. Let's see if we can go back up and look at some of the longer ones, we actually see the same behavior. And if I scroll down, it's really, it looks like about the same number of pages. So it's just, it's just doing the same thing, just a little bit slower. And that to me is saying that it's not necessarily a problem with the service. It's just something more in general. So if we come back and we go back to these, let's go back to the things. This was the owner's controller. Let's pick something else out on the owner's controller uh, to look at. And we can sit here. We see this is the update owner and we see the stack. Uh, what we didn't see the last time, this is now active. So I click this view full trace. And now rather than just looking at the calls for that one piece, I can look at the whole interaction as things are flowing down this architecture. I can see the React layer calling the other pieces. And I can see that API owner is calling the update owner. So we get to see these things in full context. But these, you know, it's like this is still, even this isn't taking a whole lot of time. So we definitely need to start looking somewhere else. We can actually come back to our machine learning job. We have a few other integrations set up. Jump in and look at the service analysis. So with APM data, you're looking at the things that are coming just from the APM. But since that data is stored as an index, it's fully accessible to use in the same way you would use any other data in, in the Elastic, from the Elastic Stack. On this top, we have the APM data and overlaid with it are actually machine learning discoveries, we'll I call them, I'm not sure if they had a real name, where there were anomalies. And I can actually see that we had some times where we had some big outliers. We have a grid that's showing me APM service information and it's like, a, I guess, a heat map of the various response times. The red is obviously slower. I can actually go in and let's filter through on this and zoom a little bit more on that timeline and we can start to see okay, if we get in there now we start to see that there is definitely a lot of stuff going on here um a lot of the services are red or orange but we can see that some are still fine so we actually see that in this case it's address finder and then address finder so there's the our three instances of the address finder are not having issues but if i jump back to this architecture Address finder is a different path and it's using Elasticsearch. So like right away, we see, can see that there's something going on probably on the MySQL side of the world here. So if we come back, let's go ahead and see what else we have in our actions. Infrastructure analysis. Now this is something that's pretty powerful. Tanya alluded to this. This is a metrics viewer specifically geared for looking at things inside in, like in an infrastructure, in a data center, in multiple data centers. I can actually go through, like I mentioned at the beginning, this is a Kubernetes cluster. We have three hosts. Like I said, these are all 64, 64, co 64 core instances. In the Kubernetes view, we can actually go back in there and you'll, you'll notice that 
I have some filtering controls of the way I want to do these things. I, want to, I can filter by namespace, or I can even go ahead and filter by node. Let's go ahead and filter by namespace or node. Let's get rid of the namespace and just go for node. Now, in this case, these are my three different servers. We can see that something's a little darker, and it's actually, it is MySQL, so we're kind of on the right track, but it's only using 41% of the CPU. But because we're looking at this view from a node standpoint, this MySQL pod is using 41% of the CPU of that 64 core node. So that's kind of a lot. Let's go and dr drill down and look a little bit more from a Docker standpoint so we can look at the containers themselves. If we look by host, now we can see we have, now we're back to the same view, but we're looking at containers. We can sit here and see right away that we've got, we've got red and now we see that it's using 270% of the CPU, that, that container. We can drill down and look at the metrics. So that view, Let's pick the right time frame. Um, the ability to go in, jump right from the infrastructure viewer to this log viewer, to this metrics viewer is pretty powerful. Now, as we go through this, we start to see, all right, we've got, because this container, you may have noticed that it came in right on that container. So these containers are short-lived. They may start and stop. In this case, it was running for however long that is, a day and a half maybe. But we do see that there is some, there are some CPU spikes. So. That's something I want to kind of delve into a little bit. We have the ability to have auto refresh, but this is not live, so that's not going to help us at this point. I want to jump into some dashboards. So these logs and metrics and the APM data, they're all just separate indices. So we can actually combine these things. We actually have something set up. You can set up, reuse the different visualizations that come with the different beats modules. You can mix and match them and make them the way you want them yourself. So right here, I'm actually looking at some of the information that, that is focusing more on the MySQL side of things. I see that we have some file beat and packet beat information and some CPU resources. As I'm hovering over things, you can see that there's some correlation between these things. I see that I have some periods of blueness, the, the spikes in the MySQL query time and lock time. I'm actually gonna go with, there's a lot of noise here. Let's go ahead and filter this down and type correctly. Gonna, I'm going to filter just on a pod that the MySQL pod, I think that's the same one, but they're kind of similar. If I go ahead and drill in on one of these spikes, right away I see that we had this some slowness to a point where these query locks, we almost get to the point where we see that as this is abating, we see that we got to the point where there was no network traffic. So this this container was so consumed the way i'm looking at this container was so consumed that it couldn't even keep up with the network and network requests um, we see that there's a database backup process that's actually been running and that's kind of telling the database process could have something to do with the with the uh, cpu usage let's actually instead let's go ahead and look at the logs we jump right in so we're, we're able to tie i'm tied right from that dashboard i can jump right into the logs viewer we see a lot of things going on. It's again, it'd be great if this were something that we're still running, but it's not, so we can't use the uh, live streaming. But what I can do is that's we we know we're talking about. We saw the slow queries. Let's go ahead and filter down on some kind of get rid of some of this noise. And let's what I'm adding here is I use the use the autocomplete to find the query time, and I'm saying show me the things for that pod that had a query time of more than 30 seconds. And right away, it jumps up. It shows that we have one, two, five, one, two, five. Five different occurrences of this that really match with our little peaks at the same, probably the same time, because we do see 23, three. So every, every four hours, it looks like this is going on. And we see what it's doing. So I hear, I see the query. So this is coming from the APM interface. And I'm sorry, this is coming from the logging interface. So something outside of our APM, because we would have seen these slow queries in APM if it had been, is running this and it's getting just, it's doing a really, really bad query here. This is a, a join that has no join criteria. So it's just doing a Cartesian product against all four of those tables. So it's clearly taken a lot of time. And we see it's, this query is taking about two minutes per iteration. So that's, that's kind of, that's kind of out there. Um, 
So, you know, so we, we kind of went through real quick. We saw a few of these things. We, we were able to say, APM, hey, let me view what's going on and what was happening in my application. Didn't see anything jumping out as there. We did see that there were, there's something that could be improved with that uh, N plus one SQL query. Able to go through and use the uh, metrics viewer, infrastructure viewer to see that we had some hotspots, drill down and tie these things together and come up with two plausible things that, you know, not sure if it's one or both that are causing these issues, but we definitely have two places to look to see what are causing these things. Um, I think at this point, I think we move on to Q and A. That's, I'm gonna stop my sharing if I can find the button. Yep, I think Q and A is a good idea. There's been some uh, some good chatter in IRC, but for those that are not in IRC, we might re repeat some of the questions that were already answered there just so that we can um, capture this. So there was a question as to whether the infrastructure UI is free or is it commercial, it's free. Uh, so both the infrastructure and log viewer, I should have mentioned this, is uh, under our basic license. It's, it's free perpetually for, for anybody that downloads the default distribution of our products. And there was also a question about which version it's in. Some folks are on 6.4, which is pretty pretty current, uh, but they were wondering, you know, I, I don't see it. So it's in, in 6.5. 6.5 is the version that was released a few weeks ago, uh, I think beginning of November, something like that. So, so go, if you're on 6.4 or something like that, it should be a really easy rolling upgrade to 6.5, and you can have all of these features. You will just see them natively in Kibana as infrastructure and logs tabs. OK. Um, what data do you need uh, to kind of to power these UIs? There was a question about, like, is it some specialized data source, or is it something else? And uh, the answer is it just is file bit and metric bit. So, so for um, the, those two UIs, we actually have a getting started guide uh, under the products uh, that we can share in RSC shortly here for those that are there. And um, I'm, I'm going to show in the, in the closing slide as some resources. Uh, you can go to the documents and they'll tell you which beats to set up, uh, which processors to enable. Uh, so, so look for the infrastructure and logs monitoring guide uh, on the Elastic documentation to get all the details for how to set up those two apps with the right data sources. But really, it's just file bit and metric bit. OK, and there was another question that I saw uh, that I think was answered, but I, I just want to make sure. And, and this was really about rollups, like exactly how did they work. Uh, I know I skimmed over that, just in the interest of time. Uh, that topic itself can cover you know, 10 minutes, uh, and I just didn't have the time for it, unfortunately. But rollups work uh, by you defining a rollup job. And this you know, it is a pretty easy thing to do. There's an API, and there's a, also a job configurator in Kibana. And job sounds, you know, uh, maybe maybe like something something like a big deal, but really it's a very very simple definition. It's what index do you want to roll up, what metrics or you know what fields do you want to retain, and for those fields, what operations do you still want to do on them after you rolled them up? So it's kind of a declarative syntax, very easy, right? As a user, you can just sort of say, yep, yep, this this field, and on these fields, I want to do that. Uh, so you can do that again via an API or via a UI. Uh, in Kibana. And once you've done that, once you've set that up, these roll-up jobs simply just run in the background. You, there's a little task manager that you can see sort of the status of the jobs and, you know, do what you'd expect to do as a background task. So pretty easy to set up, pretty easy to, to operate. No, no external components are needed. It's all managed within Elasticsearch. Cool. Uh, so those are the questions I noted. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else. Let me just kind of glance at the chat and see if maybe uh, something else is popping up uh, that's new. And if we aren't able to answer right now, we'll actually pop back into IRC and answer them. So let's see. I think there was one on licensing in general. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think everything that we've used in this demo was, aside from hidden aspects of security, which we didn't talk about, was in was pretty much a basic license with the exception of the machine learning. Correct. Yeah. So like the APM UI you saw is also a perpetually free UI. It's under the basic license. And uh, yeah, I think the only sort of uh, component for which you would need a subscription with us was machine learning. That was a big one. Uh, it provides a lot of value uh, to, to those deployments for sure. But sort of the way we see it is you can get started at scale with all of these use cases using completely free functionality. So get yeah, d definitely check it out. It's it's hopefully something that will add value to your deployment. And then if you have a need to engage with us on a successful deployment, you know, we'd be more than happy to hear from you. Anything else you see there, Jamie? Just before we jump off, um, I'm looking at the uh, the latest ones. Yeah. 
There was one that I saw. One, one about. I think I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase. What can they use the logs viewer with? Is there any restriction, or is it just pretty much any? Yeah. So the what, yeah. So we recommend that you use it with with FileBeat, but ultimately it just relies on a certain schema. Uh, and same with with the infrastructure UI. And so you know when it comes to you know, using your own data, if, as long as the data is in that schema, the UI will work. It basically will just look at uh, uh, index types uh, or index names that, that that it expects. But you can configure that. You can say, you know, actually look at these other indexes instead. So it's configurable. Uh, again, more information is available in the docs. Uh, and ultimately, if you have existing data that didn't come from FileBeat, but if it conforms to the schema that we expect, or if you uh, set up field aliases, uh, it, it should work. Uh, and, and the goal is really to make it turnkey with our shippers, but also sort of this is where common schema comes in. Uh, if, if yeah, It's open. If you have some other methods of shipping the data, these UIs will work as long as it's in, in the expected schema. Okay. Cool. Well, I see some additional questions. I know that the uh, team members are responding to them. What, what I'll say is maybe what we can do is, Jamie, let's share a couple of closing slides just to show folks the resources that we have. And uh, you know, after that, we'll stick around in IRC to answer more questions. All right, I am sharing. There we go. Very good. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, this this functionality is in the latest release, the six point five release. If you already have it, or if you can easily upgrade it, an easy way to experience all of this is to simply go to the UI, or for instance, this add data UI, and just try out some of our modules. It's uh, pretty easy for you to get the data in and start taking a look at what you can do with it. If you don't have the latest version, uh, you know you can set this up easily just via a standalone download or go to Elastic Cloud, where we always have the latest version and just spin up a hosted uh, instance. There's a, a free trial. You can you, you can do anything you want with that uh, for uh, a certain amount of time. That way, you can kind of see how things work before you um, commit to kind of uh, running it in another environment. Um, the last slide just has a couple of resources. As I mentioned, there, you, know, you can go to some of our uh, product and solution pages to find out more about logs, infrastructure metrics, and APM as use cases. There's also a container monitoring page that's dedicated to that use case in particular, given just sort of the trends we've seen. And you know, we hope that you've enjoyed it. We hope that you see uh, that with the stack, you can start putting together some of these data sources that are often kept separately into hopefully a peanut butter and jelly-like sandwich that actually gels together really quite well and you get sort of a one plus one equals three type of scenario. If you have any outstanding questions after we're done with uh, the IRC chat, where we'll stick around for sure, uh, drop into discuss, discuss at elastic.co. We have three forums uh, that are dedicated to these new UIs, uh, APM, infrastructure, and logs. Please ask questions. Please give us feedback. We'd really like to understand your use cases and you know, what we can do to continue to improve some of the turnkey solutions in these areas. Finally, if you've got a feature request, a bug, uh, GitHub is the way we engage with the community. All of our uh, development is in open source. So you can uh, jump into one of these repos. You can give us feedback. Uh, and and, and you know, if, it's, if it's more like a, a feature request or, or a bug, uh, and, and you know, the, the satisfying part is you know, when, when you'll see a developer directly engage, ask you for more information, and and hopefully get a fix. And and for those of you that are contributors, you know, thank you, and we look more to more of your contributions. I think with that, we'll close the video part of this webinar, and we'll stick around in IRC to answer more questions for anybody that's um, that's still there, and maybe if your questions didn't get answered, you know, ask it again, and we'll we'll try to answer. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.